today we're going to talk about maps <laughs> and specifically um, how maps can lie. <laughs> and so the kind of ways that maps uh, are one of the th things I think that we tend to um, kind of look at and accept a lot more in, um, in ways that we don't do as much even anymore with, for example, media and news and with books. So people are, are a lot more aware these days of, let's say, media lenses and biases of different authors or something like that in books. Uh, and so you might read a book and you understand kind of the background or bias of that author. And yet we open up a map and we see a map and it just immediately, it's as if it's reality, <laughs> you know, as, and we don't I get, uh, think of it as the same way where it has an author. That author has biases and all sorts of unwritten um, ideas about that are going into why the map is like that. So <laughs> nowadays we are in a um, society where we view our world uh, through maps more fully than ever in the past. It's kind of impossible to even not think of a map when you think of walking around your own neighborhood anymore. Uh, and maybe, maybe we pay some attention to it. Maybe we sometimes don't pay any attention to it as Google is telling us uh, where we should be riding or our bikes or our cars or walking around. Or maybe we are using that to paint the individual picture we have of the neighborhood all around us. But in any event, uh, maps are more fully framing uh, our worldview than has ever been true in the past. In fact, you know, just within a few centuries ago, uh, maps would have been quite rare things and most people in the world would not be ordering their picture of the universe or the world from maps at all. The way you would understand, let's say, how um, anything fits together would have been in, as a sort of um, internal relative uh, itinerary where you think, let's say, if I'm going to go from here to London, you think of all the landmarks on a, on a line in your head between here and there, not as a map at all, but rather the different things that are in between here and, and London. Uh, that's completely changed now. We use maps for all kinds of things, like uh, to teach science, why if, it's, if there's climate change and the world is having record uh, uh, temperatures, why has it been so cold here in winter? <laughs> you know, so looking at, for example, things like the polar vortex and, uh, you know, to be able to show those kind of ideas. Uh, they are also, we use, uh, can scientifically draw maps <laughs> in order to uh, do things like undermining democracy. So, for example, this is a congressional district, <laughs> if you can imagine, uh, in the United States, <laughs> uh, which is drawn specifically to um, prevent anyway, to, to concentrate all the people in one party into one very crazy uh, district. The other one is also pretty crazy. <laughs> There's all kinds of different things we can use maps for whenever we're thinking about things. <laughs> um, I don't know if you are immediately recognizing that, but there's Winterfell <laughs> and the North and goes all the way up to the Wall and Castle Black. <laughs> and the different islands and King's Landing. Anyway, someone has essentially um, taken Game of Thrones and imagined, well, what if this world of Westeros you know, were to be a modern European map with the kind of uh, European roadways and other kinds of things like, <laughs> anyway, how the map of any, any European style map would be today. You can do it the other way. <laughs> so, for example, by making um, uh, maps into, this is a Tolkien-esque map of North America or the kind of fantasy New England <laughs> map. Um, people, maps have become all kinds of interesting ways of art and there's beautiful maps that people make these days. <laughs> so maps also um, have a certain kind of legitimacy. <laughs> and so uh, I posted this a, a month ago on Facebook uh, and I, all of my responses from Facebook is things like, um, you know, I live in Upper Michigan and we have never called, um, you know, pop kids coffee. <laughs> you know, and people were quite indignant that, you know, in Virginia that you would think that it was called broth. And so that's all the responses all were. And obviously this is a joke map, right? <laughs> so this is not, and yet people look at the map and they did not anybody immediately jump to the conclusion that this is simply a made up or a joke map. Uh, they instead disputed it, <laughs> you know, based on the fact that they hadn't heard in their land that they don't all, in, in nobody in Las Vegas just calls pop by the generic name Tab. You can tell that I'm from the 
blue area here because this is what the actual map that's more famous and so um, all through the blue area people use the word pop to call soft drinks they say soda in these yellow areas and they generically in the south call Pepsi Coke right what kind of Coke do you want Pepsi right <laughs> so that's the <laughs> that's the idea and then there's always the, uh, the interesting thing so Mike We's not, um, even though he's a Midwesterner like me, so I'm from here and he's from right here. Okay. Nevertheless, in Milwaukee, they say soda because it's one of these strange little islands of soda in the middle of the pop sea. So, and again, that's not going to happen. <laughs> you know? So even if, even if water levels rise, this is what the onion says Australia will look like in 2045. Well, the so, <laughs> exactly. So it's pretty, <laughs> you know, when we see maps, you know, again, like I say, we have to realize you can make maps of all kinds of things, including for, for the onion. So if you've been here uh, before, if you like ever in our, in our big bathroom, we have this map, which I made, <laughs> um, which is a map of Ontario, which shows where all of our creating connection uh, meetup groups are and so right here kind of oh, I guess we can zoom in so in Toronto we have the history theology philosophy group that you can kind of see right there and the mindfulness meditation group so that's the meetup that we have at six o'clock and part of the idea of having all these groups in yellow to show them and even making a map like this uh, in a way was because as we were creating um, this creating connection program by making a map of it and showing all the and putting all the groups on the map suddenly there are groups, suddenly it's a real thing because there is a map, you know, and so maps um, provide that kind of legitimacy and so we very deliberately made this map for that, for that purpose as we're launching the program. This is a map actually made a long, long time ago for um, the Strategic Air Command Museum in Omaha. <laughs> they, they very much wanted to have um, uh, Cold War era style maps that are very big at, at showing NATO uh, facing off against the communist bloc, you know, using these kind of very stark, this map was really very tiny, right, in the, in the actual thing, but anyway, it's all blew, blown up here, you know, showing Iron Curtain and this, um, the red threat, you know, as uh, in the middle of the Strategic Air Command was worrying about facing off against uh, the commies, as it were. And so that's certainly a traditional way of how I think that map you know, was often portrayed in the Cold War era when I was a kid. Um, but another way of looking at it uh, comes from the Times Atlas of World History, um, which sees it quite a different way from a different perspective or a different projection where uh, the Soviet Union and China and the other communist countries are kind of surrounded, as you can see, by the US, uh, its allies and, for example, its missiles and everything like that, which are containing, you know, as part of the containment strategy. So in some sense, uh, with the other map, as it's sometimes portrayed, as, the, as we actually deliberately did it in the Strategic Air Command Museum, you know, you're seeing this ominous threat. On the other hand, if you look at it from the perspective maybe of the Soviets, that maybe the threat was the other side, right? So when we look at the Mercator projection, <laughs> This is designed for uh, sea navigation, um, and it's good for that, but it's actually fairly bad for um, understanding the world. There's a lot of distortion in this map, although it might have been the map that you had uh, printed out on a, on a um, school, you know, in many ways, it's a big, it's a big map in your, on your school classroom in elementary and junior high. So one of the core places of distortion that people sometimes point out, you know, is here the relative size, as you see, of Greenland, uh, the island of Greenland and the continent of Africa. And so if you were to actually then correct for the relative sizes, you know, on the Mercator projection, uh, they're approximately the same size, but in real, in real life, Greenland is obviously much, much, much smaller than, than Africa. Um, and that is actually sadly true for Canada too. <laughs> so we also, you know, win big on the Mercator projection, uh, but when you distort, you know, to the same size as what it would look like projected at, at Africa on the Mercator projection, that's the size of Canada comparatively. Yes, Jane. 
So Jane asked who or what is Mercator? So Mercator is a uh, geographer of the early modern period. So uh, one of the, um, you know, in this age, sometimes the Europeans call the age of discovery. And so he produced this map projection uh, and the idea of a map projection is that the world is a, is a sphere or, you know, close to a sphere, not a perfect sphere. And the way we uh, end up having to make, if we're going to make a flat map of it, uh, we have to introduce some kind of distortion. And so, for example, um, the way this works is, as you can imagine, so at the top of it is the, the world is actually would normally be it's getting smaller, right, as it's folded in. Instead, it's being expanded out. And you can also see it's being stretched this way, too. You can see between the lines here, right? So the Mercator projection is, is stretching and distorting the north so that it's larger. And everything that is near the equator is the least distorted, but it's also projected to be quite the smallest. And so the way that that's helpful is because then the lines of longitude and latitude are, are perfectly you know, um, parallel with each other, right? And, and in 90 degree angles. And so it helps in terms of being able to do navigation as you are drawing lines that ships are gonna be sailing and this kind of a thing. Um, but the problem with it is, uh, you know, very good for navigation, that's what it's for, but then it was bad to put into school classrooms. <laughs> So for kids to be learning about, you know, the you know countries, there's plenty of kids who would have grown up thinking that Greenland is like super huge, <laughs> and I mean, I mean, if you can imagine, if you um, watch, um, like Jimmy Kimmel and things like that, the number the people who who he goes outside at um, you know Hollywood or whatever, and they can't identify the United States on a map, you know, they're like going. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, can't, you know this kind of a thing. So I mean, so the geographic um, literacy is quite low in a lot of places, and so you know this is something that if you if you just saw it and hadn't really, if your teacher hadn't spent a bunch of time explaining that, you could be quite um, you know forgiven to under to misunderstand uh, based on this particular teaching tool, right? I'm not clear on what this one is showing. So what this one is showing is um, if, so this is the size of Africa on the Mercator projection, and that's the size of Canada on the Mercator projection. And so if you were to, to project Canada at the same size as um, where Africa would be, that's how it should be appear. Instead, it's, it's distorted to be much larger. And then, they're, and then they're just showing how that would be relative to Africa. So you can see that the continent of Africa is much larger than Canada. In that gray area, Greenland? No. no, no, it's just islands in Canada. <laughs> no, Greenland would be over here. John, could you repeat the question for the online Okay, audience? the question is, is that big gray area up there uh, Greenland? And the answer is it's just Canadian islands that are up in, in the Arctic. And so um, this is another way of showing the same thing. So people, if people are wondering how big Africa is, you could fit the United States, China, the rest of China, India, you know, Spain, France, Germany, uh, Belgium, Italy, and all of Eastern Europe, Japan, and over here, the UK and Madagascar. <laughs> so you could fit all those things into Africa because of how big Africa is. And we think of it as being the same size as Greenland because of this really bad map, <laughs> you know, that everybody is kind of overly familiar with, right? I think that's a neat map, <laughs> so, okay. so. <clears throat> this is an example of uh, someone attempting to fix the problem of the Mercator projection. So again, the goal is always that we have a, the world is a sphere, and you are trying to represent um, a spherical planet on flat, you know, surface in terms of a map. And so what, uh, you know, Hajime uh, Narukawa here, who is a architect in Japan, uh, in his projection has done is we have essentially an equal area projection. So you can see how big Africa is, let's say, compared to Canada, and how the size of Greenland kind of is. So the, how the equal area works. And then the distortions, um, because of the way this projection works, the distortions are happening in places like right here. You know, like here near 
you know, they should, they should have the here. Lines of latitude and longitude there. They're, they're there. They're there. They're just oh, very oh, and oh, you, I so I, they're actually, just very light in this map. But anyway, they are there, and that's why I'm just pointing out places where the major distortion is, which is in the middle of the ocean, right? Yeah. So there's not even major island. The major island chains are also not getting that kind of. Thing. You can see it's a little distorted here. New Zealand looks a little crazy next to, you know, Australia's got Brazil. a little. <laughs> yeah, and Brazil up at the, up at, is getting distorted up at, at Recife there. You can say it's a little more accurate, but it's a, it's a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so it's a, the comment is it's a bit of a stretch. <laughs> All right. So nicely, um, I was very happy like a year or so, a couple years ago, when if you're on Google Maps and you are uh, tooling all around the planet and you start to pull back and pull back, at a certain point, now it switches and, you've, and you, you kind of pull back from the flat earth and you are into like a globe. <laughs> So, uh, so it doesn't take very long before, because Google Maps had that same distortion as it was kind of running around a Mercator projection in the past, but now, um, anyway, it quick, pretty quickly gets to spherical, which allows you to kind of rotate the world around, and anyway, it's quite a nice tool. So one of the things about the way maps are, as we've inherited them, is that we have quite a, a focus on coastlines. And so, for example, this is a uh, national flag. What, what country? Cyprus. Cyprus. So essentially, Cyprus is, I think, possibly because the, they don't have anything else that they felt that was representing Cyprus. On the other hand, maybe they're also focusing on the idea that they, the country claims to own the whole island, although it's, um, anyway, not entirely held by the Cypriots. Um, anyway, but we get to the focus is on, on you know, essentially the shape of the country based on its coastlines. And that's in part because modern maps as we have them are derived from what we call Portolano charts. And so in the 13th century, medieval Italians and Catalans um, developed charts for sailing around the Mediterranean, uh, which included, you might see these now, these are instead of longitude and latitude, these are rum lines. And so these are different. Essentially, these are all the different places where the, the different compass winds are all coming from. And, and the idea of it was being able to, initially, all the sailing before they had these kind of maps in the Mediterranean, you would never wanted to leave sight of shore if you can help it. Because once you sailed kind of off, you don't have a compass, you don't necessarily know which way you're going. Once you can't see the shore anymore, who knows what's going to happen, even if it's fairly um, you can't get too lost in the Mediterranean, <laughs> you know, I would say. But in any event, they still, you know, would always kind of hug that. At a certain point then when they developed charts like this, they were able to um, uh, navigate, you know, over, you know, over, anyway, in the open sea. What did you call the lines? Uh, rum, lines? rum lines. Rum lines. Yeah. And so essentially they're like, um, like a compass wheel. So they create these compass wheels and then e each one of these places around a circle is where uh, each one of the winds, essentially, to give all the different wind directions. Uh, and that's, anyway, before they have latitude and longitude, they use those. But that's why we have that. So once that started happening, um, people started picturing, this is the beginning when people, you can kind of see, there's Italy, right? <laughs> so you see Italy and the Adriatic and Sardinia and here's Tunisia. Libya. So in other words, it's, it's already recognizable here in a 700-year-old um, map, right? Well, they're pretty good on the uh, shape. Sardinia, I think, is a little bit too, too far west. Yeah, so the, the comment is a pretty good shape. And yeah, and whether or not it's, there's still um, inherited distortions, and so Italy's still got a little bit more of a curve and things like that because that's how the ancient Romans thought it was. <laughs> Uh, but in any, in any event, they're already getting pretty good. So, not all maps were always like that. In fact, that was a new thing. So now, if we uh, go further back, um, the only map, essentially, that we have from ancient Rome, we actually have, a, it's a medieval copy, but it's, uh, it's definitely a copy. <laughs> so in other words, they, it's not like something that people made in the Middle Ages because it's just filled with, uh, all of this information that didn't exist anymore in the Middle Ages. And so um, you can see uh, the map itself is this long skinny thing. <laughs> and so it's, it's uh, 6.75 meters 
wide by a third of a meter tall. And you can kind of see just from how it works is, this is actually a map of the whole world, but it's a map of the whole world from the Roman perspective, and so it is essentially the Roman Empire. And so what you can see here is that Britain is up here, and this is Spain. This is all North Africa, or actually Africa. And this line, this blue line here is the Mediterranean. And over there, that little part there is Turkey, you can see, Greece, and then this is Italy, right? And so then India is way over in the far corner. And so then zooming in on this, right in the center of the map, there's a big circle and it says Roma. And you can see that all of these orange lines are leading to Roma. <laughs> And so what this actually is, is a Roman road map. And so the Romans have created here a map of their entire road network, which is so important to the Romans, right? And so all the different Roman uh, roads are leading here. And the point of it, therefore, is not in any sense that the Romans thought that, that the world is that skinny and short, but rather that this is just a way to show the roads and all the different points between them you know, in kind of a big kind of road network map that you could fold up and fold out that way as opposed to needing something that would be so, so tall. They're not worried here about coastlines because the Romans really hated the water, <laughs> you know, so they tried not to, and this is not for that purpose um, uh, in terms of the navigation. And instead, it's for getting around on the road, road network. And so, so the um, we don't know when the uh, I think when the original is because it's lost, but it would be you know from the you know the height of the Roman Empire and its network. So maybe it's in the third century map, the original. But anyway, it's a the medieval one is in the central Middle Ages. There's a copy that's made of it, and so the one that we have that survived is uh, is a copy. So that's not the, that's actually quite um, normal and how people, like I mentioned, this is actually how people thought of um, uh, getting around places is in this kind of itinerary style, like I was saying. You may not have had an actual map, like that Roman map, quite rare, and same thing, this 17th century map um, from England, which is again, is showing a road map from London to Land's End. So essentially you're starting here, you know, in London, you're going down the road like that to get to uh, the end of the, of the road map. And the idea of it here is that you can see that they're actually pointing out which way north is you know, as you're going along, which is to say it's following here the road and it's not worrying at all about the cardinal direction because what was most important was you get on this road and you want to go to this place. <laughs> so now you, you follow that along as opposed to a, uh, a road network. And so what normally actually uh, predates all of these, including the big Roman one we saw, is that normally what you'd have is simply a list of all of the itinerary. And so that's how it would, generally speaking, a map is quite expensive uh, and, and paper is expensive. Instead, you just would have a, a list of all of the different places you go. So, you know, it would be, um, you know, you'd have a list, let's say, of what all the subway stations are as opposed to a map you know, one after the other. You know you're gonna get off at the one that comes after paper or whatever. Like this one. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so an example of schematic maps that have continued and continue to be useful to this day, for example, are um, transit maps, right? And so when we do <coughs> a map of the transit system, the, like the subway system here in Toronto, um, this is not to scale the distance here between Union Station and uh, uh, Blur Young compared to, let's say, between Blur Young and Kipling, right? Because at a certain point, these stations are all starting to be quite far apart from each other in terms of actual um, geography. And same thing all the way up here, right? This is an old one. We got more stations now. That's nice. <laughs> anyway, uh, but uh, anyway, so they're meant to be useful schematically as opposed to um, worrying about coordinate geography or, frankly, where the coastline is. We don't have to worry about where Lake Ontario is when we're in the subway, right? I was going to say about the uh, strip map, um, I don't know if you still can, but you certainly used to go to the CAA or the AAA and get them, you tell them I'm going from A to B and they would make you up um, a, 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 a strip map. They'd make you one of these. Make you, yeah, make you one of those and it showed where you should, how you should go and what was along the way and where the hotels and motels and so on were. Would they hand draw them? How would they do it? Uh, they had, um, 
they would put together, they, they had the, the components, the different, oh, okay. yeah. the different <laughs> ones, and they would just assemble it. Yeah, neat. Yeah, so exactly. So this is something that, um, anyway, has a lot of utility, and we can even see it now. I mean, nowadays, our phone tells us where, how to get to lands, <laughs> you know, and from London, <laughs> you know, and so that you don't have to worry about it. But at a certain point, having the itinerary, that's what you actually need. You don't need all of this extraneous information about what's on the left or right of this road. You want to just know what road to stay on, right? And where the inns are. And where are the inns, yes. <laughs> so huh. this is kind of fun. This is some, when, then somebody then pictured uh, what if Canada, populated Canada, were a giant city that had a transit map. <laughs> and so essentially um, from downtown Toronto here, you know, you'd get on the Trans-American, I'm sorry, Trans-Canadian uh, <laughs> line, you know, and get all the way out to, here's Saskatoon and Calgary and all the way out here to Vancouver and so forth, all the way back over, you know, Eastern. So like, anyway, to zoom in on it, you can see kind of what Toronto to Hamilton and kind of the lower Ontario component of that map. Anyway, so just a way to um, envision it. This is not a real transit, obviously. Yeah. Please inform Doug Ford. <laughs> Mention LRT also. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, we definitely need transit. <laughs> so, so we should definitely start building, right? Yep. Okay, <laughs> so another question about maps. So why is <laughs> north at the top? You've probably seen a map like this, since these are now becoming fairly um, well known. But essentially there is no particular uh, reason that we, just by convention, we stick north at the top. And it's actually quite hard. You know, whenever I think of even, um, I don't know, when I try to even think of the city, I have to, have to turn this way. This is north, <laughs> you know, and then I think, okay, and this is, you know, to the east, that's the direction of Scarborough and Etobicoke, and so in other words, I know the lake, you know, so I think of those kind of things. I, I you know, orient myself by even turning physically sometimes north. Uh, and in that same way, you know, if we, by, um, there is a, obviously more land in the northern hemisphere, and there's way more wealth in the northern hemisphere, and so there's all sorts of uh, bias about perhaps having north be on top, uh, the, the idea of having these reversed maps so that there's no reason why they shouldn't be this direction. And indeed, there's a long tradition of that. Uh, and so specifically, medieval Arabic uh, Muslim cartography almost always had south of the top, although not always. Um, and so this map, um, it's a, just a beautiful map from the 12th century uh, a scholar named al Adrisi, who was working in the court of the Norman king of Sicily, Roger uh, II. Um, so he is here in Sicily. You have to remember, the so north is that way, right? So you get to see it this way. So, so this is the Mediterranean. There's Spain and Italy, Denmark. This is the Balkans. This is the Black Sea. Here's Turkey. Here's the Caspian, the Nile, Egypt, North Africa, Arabia, Persia. India is here, and then China. Right? So it's quite a lovely map. So what's all of this, and what's all this over here and all of this? <laughs> what? Shaheen. Yeah, you can, you can. <laughs> ocean is up here. So the ocean, yes, the original meaning of the ocean is um, is that the encircling sea that the ancient uh, Greeks all believed, in fact, ocean didn't, you know, we now have all these different oceans, right? But the original idea of the ocean is that this is the, the sea that encircles Eurasia, Africa. And so this is the uh, Eastern Hemisphere. So actually what all of this is, these are like the mountains of the moon. This is the source of the, the Nile, which, and then actually also um, the, uh, Niger, right, which is the, the, it, over here. So they assumed that it also linked up. Um, but the uh, um, idea here is Ptolemy, again, an ancient uh, uh, Greco-Roman uh, geographer, uh, believed that there was this whole long um, zone here of the southern, what essentially where Australia is. And so for a whole long time, people believed that the, there was a Asia-sized continent down there. <laughs> Uh, and so then this is part of how it's all shown. So it's essentially the part of the world that's south of the equator, and it had to balance out uh, Asia because the idea that they had was in ancient Greece that everything had to have balance. 
And so if there's a big continent up here in Eurasia, there must be another big one down in the south. And, uh, and then also, also, by the way, the ancient Greeks presumed <laughs> that there also had to be two more on the other side of the planet, which is to say North and South America, uh, because um, of balance. <laughs> so anyway, uh, they had no knowledge of it. But anyway, that's why, that's why it looks like that. And the lines here, longitude lines, are climate zones. So essentially the idea of it that they understood, they under, everybody understood in the Middle Ages that the world is a sphere. This map is showing that by showing uh, the zone where it's too hot to live, the zone that's just kind of perfect, the zones where it's too cold to live. The, the previous slide you had, is that the, is that the uh, politically correct uh, equal area projection of some kind? It is another equal area projection. So yeah, so there's multiple equal area ones. There's not just that Japanese one that I showed. Uh, essentially, that's why, again, Canada's getting squished compared to how we normally think of it. But it's because, again, Canada isn't bigger than Africa, <laughs> you know, even though we'd like, you know, we'd, we're used to the Mercator, right? And so, so because of that, uh, the, the northern area is getting squished as is Antarctica. Canada. Yeah, so Russia and Canada and Alaska. All right, so as we might know, just by the, if we think about the word orientation, even though I was saying I orient myself by, you know, turning to the north, but we know that the word the orient means the east because, um, of anyway, the, the word the orient, and that's because in Latin, uh, orients means east, and so orientation means turning actually to face east, and this is because uh, all Roman maps, generally speaking, and medieval Christian maps, uh, originally always had east at the top. And so there was actually, in the late medieval period, the early modern period in the west, a shift from having east at the top of all the maps to having north at the top of all the maps, which is why we now have north at the top. But essentially, this is a, um, the, mo the simplest and the most common uh, kind of Roman map. And this is a Roman map that, again, showing the world is a is round. In this case, it's showing um, there are three continents as far as the Romans are concerned and the Greeks, which are Africa, Europe, and Asia. And Africa and Europe are only half as big as Asia, according to uh, the Romans understood. They're separated by the Mediterranean, and then Africa is separated from Asia by the Nile, and Europe is separated from Asia by the Don River. So essentially that was a teaching tool um, for Roman kids to understand how the geography of the world kind of works. Um, and why do you have something like that, do you suppose? Oh, we'll go ahead with Elizabeth. Yeah, I can read Orients at the top and Occidents at the bottom, but what's on the left and right? Okay, so Orients, East, Occidents, West, um, Septemtrio, which is to say North, and Meridies, which is South. And then what it's saying, what is it saying here under Asia? Europa and Africa. Uh, they're the three sons of, uh, of Noah. The three sons of Noah. So Shem, Cham, Ham, and Japheth, right? And so the idea here that this um, is actually an early modern version of this kind of map because it's a printed map. Um, but this one uh, here is that um, Christians have decided at some point or other that everybody's descended from uh, Noah's family. And the equation that they had was that, that Asians are uh, descendants from the, uh, the Semites, as they said, or the Semitic peoples, so Arabs and, and Jews are uh, descendants of that, that Africans, the Egyptians are descendants of Hamitic people, and then the Europeans are Japhethetic. And so this is like the beginning of um, European racial understanding or you know, that kind of thing that's happening in the Middle Ages. There's no, that's not the case. <laughs> this is, the Bible doesn't say any such thing. Uh, this is simply something that people are coming up with in the Middle Ages. And you can see also around here it says Mare Oceanum, which is to say, again, the ocean, the encircling, the sea of the ocean that encircles the, uh, the lands of the northeastern hemisphere, which is what this is showing. Yes, there's a question. What's it saying where? What does it say in the middle, like more magnum fire? No. Um, Mar Mar Mare magnum, seaway, medit, 
Rhenaeum. So which is to say the Great Sea or the um, Mediterranean, the middle, okay. middle of the Earth Sea. So Medi Medi Mediterranean is just Latin for medial, media, middle, and terra, Earth, right? So the idea that Mediterranean just means sea in the middle of the Earth. And so that's what this is. The Great Sea or the sea in the middle of the Earth, it says. You were saying that the middle is the Don River, right? That, that divides Europe and Asia? Yes. So I thought that the middle was the Don River. Is it not? So it's the Mediterranean? So, so they're labeling it here like is the whole thing is the Mediterranean, but in fact, if this was being drawn properly, it, this would say the Tanias, Don River in other words, and this would say Nilus, you know, Nilius or whatever, Nilus, and so that would say Nile. So um, in many other versions of this, it will label the Nile as the border between Africa and Asia. We don't put that there now. So for us, the, the border is the Suez Canal now. <laughs> Right, and so the, uh, the border is, but um, the way it worked is that half of Egypt is in Asia, according to the Greeks and Romans, and half of it's in Africa. And same thing, the border is not, we've now, there, we try to make a border between Europe and Asia. There's, Europe is not a continent in what we now understand continents to be because it's simply an extension of Asia, right? So it's just the same way that India is. Uh, but we now make the border usually at the Ural Mountains because why not? We had to put it somewhere. <laughs> and so, but it used to be the River Don. Yeah. All right. So um, this is one of the ones we were using to, or a similar one anyway, to uh, have it as our, you know, in, in the, on the front screen, the title screen. And so one of the things that we could always point out here is that maps reflect the biases of their makers. And so here is a mid 18th century um, British map of North America, which is definitely um, representing a, a very British perspective <laughs> of North America at the time. Um, for example, uh, laying claim, you know, so for a colony like North, North Carolina, where frankly the English settlement didn't get much past here, nevertheless, as far as the British are concerned, this goes all the way, you know, there's this North Carolinians are over here and, you know, what's now I guess uh, Oklahoma or Kansas or something, you know, New, New, whatever is over here. <laughs> so same thing, this is all Virginia and New York is claiming Ontario even. And so the French are kind of left with just the area around Montreal <laughs> and all this stuff that nobody cares about as far as the British are concerned. <laughs> so anyway, um, we will still find, oh, I just zoom in so you can kind of see. So the, again, there's just the area of British settlements that's there and yet that's claim is laid, obviously, to the whole continent. And the more, more common map that you'll find is still like this, um, which is going to, uh, anyway, acknowledge French claims, <laughs> you know, uh, prior to the, to the French and Indian War. Uh, and so, essentially, there are French forts, and that's probably most of them, frankly, for this entire territory that is laying out uh, here that's getting labeled blue. Um, and, uh, and so anyway, the, up to the cl this clam. Um, and that, this is still a very common map. It was very easy for me to find a map like this um, to show it. What's much comp harder to find, you know, is anything like the um, map of, let's say, who was actually there, you know, who was in all of these different places. So uh, essentially showing the different First Nations, Native Americans, and where they all might have been. Shaheen? There's a relatively recent online resource that maps out indigenous territories all over the world and how they've changed over time, as well as the treaties that govern those areas. Yeah, so I've, I've got a, I'm gonna, I have a link to it here, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Maybe it's a different one, but yes, absolutely. But in, in general, so there's good online stuff now, and that's nice. Um, we're still missing something. So this map is quite findable, which is to say a map that we're, and there's several versions, let's say, which is to say, it's almost always presented as First Nations or Native peoples prior to um, Columbus or something. And so it'll essentially um, group uh, different First Nations by, generally speaking, cultural areas or geographic areas, types of the plains in the Northeast, Northwest, Southwest, that kind of thing. But what we don't ever have, you know, so it, so it's essentially a combination of these two maps which is to say, you know, there is some fairly solid and dense English settlement on, that, on the coast over here. There are these French forts, but, I, but a combined map that's showing essentially at, as of this year 1730, 
13, maybe whatever it is. 1750, I think, is whenever this is supposed to be. So it, why, why is there a map that, show, that combines essentially um, the First Nations that are, and as they are kind of living as of 1750, and uh, you know, essentially imperial outposts as opposed to imperial claims like this? So one of the very rare ones um, that I could find and that exists are um, the Five Nations uh, of the Haudenosaunee, the Iroquois Confederacy, as we often think about it. And so the, um, because um, it can't as easily be ignored, because all through the 18th century, um, the uh, Haudenosaunee were actually um, you know, a very significant power between uh, British and French North America. And so you can see there's essentially the area of you know, effective English control in red, of effective French control, which again is there's a little there's settlement in the St. Lawrence, but then it's essentially areas around the forts, and then uh, the Iroquois Confederacy in between um, as a major power broker uh, between the two. Is that map produced in Canada? Was this map produced in Canada? I don't know. <laughs> Um, it was definitely, this is a map I was looking desperately to find anything that had colonists and uh, First Nations people at the same time. It could be. Uh, it might have been. No, wh why I ask is that they uh, have Mississauga uh, listed there, very light letters. Just yeah, above so Mississauga is here, and that's, I think, because of these are, um, that's like another people, right? So these are the Mississauga people and Miami and Shawnee. In other words, these are different um, additional, additional First Nations, right? Not to belabor a point, Mississauga are Anishinaabe, which is their word for, that includes the Odawa, uh, the Chippewa South of Lake Erie, and Potawatomi, which, I, which isn't there. Yeah, yeah, so they don't have everybody. <laughs> I mean, here's the Potawatomi. Anyway, so they're, they're, they're listing a couple. So again, this is not showing everybody. It's just showing the, with a color. The only people who are getting a color here are the Iroquois, right? And so that's, that's another limitation even of this map. Um, we've looked at this one before. So obviously earlier, before um, uh, so many of the natives had uh, died from plague and everything like that, all of the different uh, diseases the Europeans brought in addition to also just destruction of uh, all their lands and being forced out of their lands and things like that. Um, one of the things here in the 1606, it's, not, it's, it's actually 1620, anyway, 1620s map of Virginia, uh, this is, north is facing that way, so north is at the top, this is the Chesapeake Bay, and you can hardly even see it in the middle of all this is Jamestown. So this one little tiny little English settlement and all these other dots and everything like that, you can see it says Powhatan, right? This whole territory. And so zooming in, here's Jamestown and every single one of these, you know, is a native settlement. So, and so essentially it was very thickly, densely settled uh, initially, but then over time, um, anyway, as the natives just had successively, you know, 50, 80, 90 percent uh, casualty rates from European diseases, uh, anyway, and also being pushed back and back across the mountains and that kind of thing, it ceased to be true. But there was a different understanding that the colonists had when they first got there, and there were so many more natives. Um, this is an interesting other um, uh, rarely seen perspective as well. <laughs> So this is a very rare um, native map. And so from 1724, um, a, the chief or leader of a um, nation in the Carolinas uh, produced this map on the back of a deer skin to describe to a South Carolinian, you know, kind of essentially how the native perspective or his own perspective anyway on how uh, uh, everything all fit together. And so you can see he's got this idea that South Carolina and the settlers have carved everything up into like squares and things like that. Uh, and over on the other side, at the other side of the trade route, there's Virginia, which is another area that's kind of set apart as a square. And then instead what's happening in between 
uh, instead of having it be uh, geographical or worrying about coastlines or any of those kind of things. Instead, it's a schematic map like we've done with, well, like we've seen with the, um, the uh, subway map and that kind of thing, where essentially the different nations, based on maybe different size, influence, economic capacity, uh, as they are in individually tied to each other through trade or other kinds of alliances, how they all then interact and between South Carolina, them, and over on the other side to Virginia. So it's a different way of viewing the world than the kind of um, latitude and longitude way that we use maps for. And I don't know if this is the one, oh, go ahead. Uh, to use a little jargon, that's a theriomorphic map. It's animal shaped. What's <laughs> yeah. the significance of that? Two well, ears, four legs? It's on a deer skin. <laughs> So the significance is that they used a deer skin to make it, <laughs> so, right? But maybe it's also it has another purpose to it too. Um, but yeah, the, um, when, we, when we'll look at the medieval maps too, the Hereford map is also, um, it's just, just by coincidence, shaped like a Hereford cow, <laughs> you know, but it's because it's been made, it's not, uh, it's because it's been made on, out of one single um, uh, cattle skin, right? And so in this case, you know, these are the different legs of the deer and the head, it would be over that way, right? So I don't know if this is what you're talking about, native-land.ca. So this is a great site um, where you can also see, like you say, go through time. And also what you can kind of see here is over, it's got overlays of all the kinds of different uh, territories. Obviously the um, native peoples weren't just static and sitting there with, and not having history um, until Columbus showed up. <laughs> um, rather, you know, they're, therefore, as they move around, um, they're quite overlapping. Um, spaces that, you know, so different lands have multiple different um, territory that can be acknowledged for them. So native-land.ca, it's a really neat um, site that you can start to correct some of these omissions. Okay, so I want to talk just a bit about this idea of borders. <laughs> Uh, because those are also, we talked about the coastlines, borders are also just amazingly prominent on Western maps. And so the idea of mapping everything with borders. And so this is um, Europe from the year 1000. Um, and this is not how Europeans in the year 1000 drew maps. <laughs> this is how Europeans in the 20th century, you know, draw, drew maps of their past. And they draw them very specifically with you know, again, we can see France, they probably, if you have an atlas, France is probably going to be purple like that, and it's going to be from the time of Charlemagne all the way up until the present day, and all that's going to happen is more or less that there's border changes, as if, um, uh, as if the modern state of France, with its total control that it might have over its own borders, um, you know, is in any way, let's say, related in terms of the um, uh, control exercised, let's say, by the Merovingians, uh, Frankish kings, uh, you know, way back in the early Middle Ages. So which is to say, these kind of borders are here and on the map, but they didn't exist uh, in kind of the, in the kind of real life of the year 1000. I'll try to explain what I mean a little bit. So one of the famous maps that um, uh, is always shown, English people I think especially like to show this map, <laughs> so um, is it's usually called the Angevin Empire or Angevin Domains uh, in France. And so the idea of it is um, you know, that King Henry II uh, and also King Richard the Lionhearted, his son, uh, more or less control um, there. Of course, we know that the Norman, they, their uh, ancestors, the, uh, the Dukes of Normandy, you know, had conquered England. And so therefore the Dukes of Normandy and the Kings of England were the same. But the Angevins, uh, by marriage, also had owned this, and so then all of that. And then when Henry II marries Eleanor of Aquitaine, she brings this claim to this whole huge territory in. Um, anyway, and then they also, while they're at it, conquer Ireland, sort of. <laughs> and so then that, that gets uh, thrown in there. And so one of the things that that's always contrasted by is we see, okay, that the king of the English owns all of this territory, and then usually it's shown that the king of France only has that little area around Paris, the dark blue part, right? Uh, and so, uh, but the problem with the map is, as always, is that, that in fact, um, 
what level of land tenure does anybody necessarily have at any of these things? So the King of France has some fairly effective control over that dark blue area, especially where um, the French kings, you know, more or less their power was quite circumscribed, but then they have lots and lots of ownership of the land within their domain. Um, Henry uh, has almost nothing, no, it's not even shown on that map, Toulouse is even blue. He gets credit for it here. Has essentially no control. They, I mean, he attacked Toulouse and was, uh, had to essentially retreat from there. So um, the amount of lands that would be comparable you know, should be shaved, shaded in to see his domain name, uh, domain lands in each one of these places. What are the king's domain lands in England as opposed to uh, showing this total control and all this kind of a thing? Um, so it's complicated, and it's way more complicated than maps, modern maps, can portray when we're trying to go back. And a lot of times we read our biases about how um, modern states work and how much control they have over their territories compared to um, the fairly limited exercise. Essentially, the king of England, you know, is, there's no, there's no capital. Uh, essentially, he, it's him and his group of I mean, a very small number of knights, so a household apparatus, you know, that may well be a couple hundred people. And as they are kind of wandering around all the, all of the land, that is essentially what's providing central government for this vast territory, which largely, therefore, has um, uh, most people at almost all levels of it have not only no contact, but no, there's no effective um, government from the king almost at all. So it's all held at local, more local levels. You know. um, and it's even um, understood in terms of the, uh, the titles that are happening. They're changing at this point, but um, still up to those time, you're not the Rex Anglia or the Duke uh, no, uh, Normania, which is to say you're not the king of England or the Duke of Normandy, but you're the Rex Anglorum, the king of the English. Uh, you're the Duke Normanorum, the king of the Normans. And so, in technically, your kingdom is kind of everywhere where the English people are. Uh, and so all English people, wherever they are, are sort of subject to, your, to English law. There might be a completely overlapping um, place where, let's say, you're, the people are, um, some people have French law and other people have some other kind of law. Uh, and you can go, depending to which center you, know, you are as a Frank, you go to the French king, that kind of a thing. So where do we get borders? So um, in some sense, uh, they're based on, initially based on Roman originals. So we don't have um, much in the way of Roman maps that survive. I showed you that uh, Roman road map that we have, which doesn't have a bunch of borders. But one of these, this, this map, which is called the cotton map from England in the 11th century, it's sometimes called the Anglo-Saxon map because it has one little, um, call out where essentially someone has written in Anglo-Saxon a name and so therefore it's a um, it's from England and by a it's mostly written in Latin uh, but uh, it's an English and Anglo-Saxon um, monk who's made it and has included a little bit of Anglo-Saxon on it uh, and so uh, what we see here is you can see kind of all these borders right lines straight lines but what these all are actually is um, so these are the, um, you know, let's see if I can read what these are, uh, Antiochina, uh, Cilicia, Asia Minor, uh, Cappadocia, so this is Turkey, right? Oh. And so what those are are all of the uh, Roman provinces, you know, of what's now Turkey. So the, essentially they're all the borders that don't exist anymore. So the Romans uh, marked out essentially on their maps uh, the borders of all of their different provinces, of which this map, again, east is at the top, remember, in all these maps, right? So this is England down here, this is the Mediterranean, this is Turkey, this is the Nile, the Red Sea, Arabia. So as the, um, uh, this is a copy, again, of a Roman map where the Roman Empire is this whole territory, which is to say the Romans are aware of this and that there's something to the east of them, uh, and, then, uh, and then the borders are essentially the Roman provinces. And so, and of course, the Romans did have an idea of borders uh, and frontiers, which is fairly similar to how the Chinese contemporaneously are doing this in terms of their frontier. Uh, but the way that the frontiers actually worked, where there were you know, very serious walls or, or walls that they built to, for an actual frontier, 
the, the frontier is not in any sense an impeg impregnable barrier that the barbarians can't get across. Barbarians can get up to here, they have ladders, <laughs> they run over it, you know, they can go back, they can get across these things without too much trouble. The problem with it is, is the idea of, for it is, is that you have a, um, a, a zone that the central government is controlling because they, they have this whole area staffed. And when a raiding party you know, gets across the border and starts running around, um, if they are gonna go sack something and they're trying to bring back all the booty, it does slow them down as they're trying to get back over the wall, you know, to get back with it and stuff like that. And so the result of it is, is that the, it's still a, um, it's not an impregnable defense, but rather it's meant as sort of a impeding raids and slowing down and also bringing essentially imperial presence to frontier lands and showing to the people on the other side, we exist, you know, we are a big empire and the, essentially the Chinese wall does the exact same thing, the Great Wall of China. It doesn't actually prevent Mongols from getting across and indeed the Mongols definitely get across and take, <laughs> take China over. But, the, uh, but it, what it does do is prevent this, uh, create this imperial frontier where the, it, that's showing, anyway, that kind of a border. So borders now definitely exist. <laughs> so there's an interesting map that the Washington Post put out um, that really shows the extent of the U.S.-Mexico border that has um, been talked about politically because of the U.S. president who essentially has envisioned, you know, building like a Hoover Dam-like uh, structure uh, in massive cement all the way across this amazingly long, <laughs> you know, anyway, frontier which again, as everybody has pointed out, is you know, totally impractical, it wouldn't do anything, and, that in, and indeed that the, the way that they do the, um, anyway, current, current border patrolling is much more effective than having some kind of structure like that. So, borders um, can, are still controversial. So Google uh, adjusts its borders, so even though Google Maps might seem to be the world of reality, you know, when, we're, uh, when you're going around, that's how we're mapping our universe. But if you are in uh, Ukraine and you go to google.com, Google Maps, it will uh, explain very clearly that the Crimea is part of your country, as it always has been. Uh, but if you go to google.ru uh, in Russia, you'll see that, in fact, uh, Crimea is an integral part of Russia. So the border changes, and that's not only true in Russia and Ukraine, but it's like definitely true in India, in China, in uh, Pakistan, all kinds of different places where there's disputed borders. Uh, Google Maps changes depending on which country you're in. Israel. Um, so, although they were originally, I would say, suggest borders were kind of lines that existed on maps, they have now achieved reality as uh, reality has caught up to the maps. This is a fairly famous and not entirely fair um, picture of a border that's uh, on the island of Hispaniola between Haiti and the Dominican uh, Republic. So Haiti has, ever since uh, achieving independence as through a slave revolt, has been punished by the international community and is therefore uh, still experiencing lots more let's say, levels of poverty than uh, the other side of the island, the Dominican Republic. And so people have noted, therefore, that part, one of the things that's happened as a result is deforestation on the one side of the border, so the border becomes apparent. Another border that people comment on as really, really, really existing, does everyone know what this one is? Korea. Korea, yeah. So at nighttime, uh, there's, you know, light pollution is not happening in North Korea. Another one. So after 25 years after the border got eliminated in Germany, and even with massive investment that West Germany has made in East Germany, um, apparently there's still you know, a vast uh, differences that implied, you know, anyway, you can see where the border was. I mean, it's drawn in here, but uh, when you look at the unemployment rate, and so obviously there's a high, high unemployment rate throughout all of East Germany, and to likewise disposable income, so the wealth, um, you can also draw it around where the former East was. So borders, once you make them, it's uh, also hard to, uh, anyway, undo it. And this would also be if <laughs> the northern regime here ever collapses and uh, the South Koreans have to uh, work on investing in North Korea, it's going to be enormously expensive and tough for them for, you know, 100 years or more. 
Okay, maps paint information, uh, uh, pictures that differ from textual argument. So one of the neat things about maps is, so there's many places where we're having, let's say, an academic article or any other thing where you make a logical argument, you make a thesis, you order um, uh, data in a kind of a logical, coherent way. Maps have a special ability to cut across that by um, showing data in all kinds of other different ways. And so one of the ways we can look at it is, for example, um, these quite famous U.S. election maps, right? And so I pulled a bunch of them just from 2008. Um, so when people look at, for example, this election where uh, Obama beat McCain, um, if you were just to look at it from you know, the red states versus the blue states in terms of area, um, you wouldn't necessarily know offhand that Obama won uh, based on that. But if you then looked at it by electors, because the Electoral College is um, Hillary Clinton found out is what counts as opposed to, you know, anyway, even the number of voters. Um, obviously, these states, although quite big in area, have many fewer electors than some of these states over here in New England, which are quite small, um, but have more people. Likewise, if you do this thing by county, it's even usually more stark um, because there's so much uh, red territory, county after county after county in the U.S., but if you look at how many people are in those counties, so again, all the red counties don't have many people in them compared to where all the people live in the blue ones. And likewise, that's going to be shown this way by, um, you know, they have population height here. So there's all kinds of different ways you can order maps. So in that case, I would just say that sometimes the seemingly distorted map, like uh, we saw before with the equal area projections, um, in some ways is correcting distortions that are inbuilt into things like that Mercator projection. So, <laughs> where's the center of the world? <laughs> so, when people make maps, part of the idea of it is center versus periphery. And um, one of the maps that I was very familiar with is not only this Mercator map, uh, but also the Mercator map that has North and South America and the middle. <laughs> so even though, um, you know, you're actually having to cut Asia in half because of, you know, I mean, right in the middle of Asia. So essentially, if you want to look at what's next to China, you got to go, you know, across to the other side. Um, nevertheless, this was still done in order to have this kind of Americocentric um, world picture. And I think I might have had this one, a map like this in my um, school growing up. What about this one? Who do you suppose made this map? China. China is our guess. Looks like China. Looks like Chinese, maybe? Korea? Korea. So, so you, can, uh, you can, Chinese probably wouldn't put Korea on it. But anyway, I don't know. But anyway, the Koreans, you know, it could be at least, um, it's an 18th century Korean map. And if you're in Korea, you might be aware that China is a big country right next to you. And, uh, but essentially, the idea of it is that we again have the encircling ocean. And there's China is dominating. You can see the Great Wall of China. Uh, and then other places like India and, you know, the East. I'm sorry, the West. How about that one? It's an older one, actually. Japan? Japan, yeah. So this one is a 14th century map that's made in Japan. Uh, and bizarrely, though, with India, dominating the whole thing. So it's like mostly all map of India, and then you can even see how big Sri Lanka is compared to Japan. China's just kind of on the edge. This is like the Himalayas, and the, um, the Mongol territory, and then the west is over here in this little tiny spot. Apparently, um, even though we don't have it, <laughs> apparently this is a tradition that the Japanese have gotten a hold of a map that somebody in China made based on something that they got from India. <laughs> So possibly spread across because of Buddhism. So essentially, the um, uh, it's a, probably initially an Indian map because it's reflecting India. But anyway, uh, that the Chinese have added themselves to in this particular case, and then the, the Japanese. This is a more recent Japanese map. Japanese map, uh, and so this is one from the 19th century, and you can kind of see uh, that it's informed uh, by Western maps, but it has put Japan in the middle, <laughs> you know, so here's Japan, 
And indeed, uh, the part of Japan, it's, it's neat because of the distortion here. Uh, it, you know, the imperial capital is at, um, not Tokyo, but what's it called? Edo. Edo. Edo isn't Edo Tokyo? No. It's uh, Kyoto. 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 So at Kyoto, and then, um, and then you know, the, the other islands that are around there, this is the part of Japan that look familiar to us, right? And then this part is actually much bigger, but it had fewer people. And then the last island that we think of at the top has almost no people, you know? And so anyway, it's really tiny. Uh, so it, again, is distorted based on uh, the importance of the uh, place to the imperial capital, Kyoto. And then this is China, India, Africa. The West is a little confused, and uh, obviously North and South America. And this potential thing that uh, the Portuguese thought, but again, Australia is connected to Antarctica still. And so they're still kind of, ha they have access to some kind of an earlier Portuguese map or something like that. And that's how um, this has been, anyway, preserved as a Japanese map in the 19th century. So we mentioned before we saw um, Adrisi's map. Um, and so in this case, uh, before we were just seeing how south is at the top, <laughs> but now as we're thinking about center versus periphery, um, what's in the middle here, <laughs> you know, is actually uh, Mecca and Medina, right? So Arabia is right at the middle of the map. So you may be aware <laughs> uh, that in medieval European maps, sort of famously, um, that the center is Jerusalem. <laughs> And so you can see in this beautiful little 13th century map, the Salter map, um, which has again that same thing that we were talking about. So the Mediterranean is here, the Black Sea, and so then this is the Don, and this is the Nile. And so essentially Europe is here, Africa is here, Asia is here, there's the Red Sea that's always red. Um, uh, anyway, so the center of that is Jerusalem, and it's often shown in circular uh, to be like a little circular center of navel of the world. And for people then who are making this, the British, you know, like the Japanese in that map where they're, which they're getting for the Koreans where China is the center of the world, the British here are definitely on the edge, you know, of the world uh, because they're aware of this bigger world that they had been a part of, the Roman world, or now the Christian, Christianized Roman world. Um, and another example of that then is the biggest map that survived uh, the Hereford map, which we were talking about before, because I was saying it's on one giant piece of a parchment that's been made from a cow. And so that's why it's this shape. It's been trimmed so it doesn't have the legs like the, the deer one. That, but anyway, it's the same. And so the same thing is happening here. The Red Sea's red, the Mediterranean, the Nile, the Don that's separating Europe and Africa from Asia. And again, Jerusalem is at the center and England like that is often the, in the periphery. But that's not the way they always were. <laughs> and so um, although um, as of this time, the 13th century, after the Crusades, um, the Christians had started putting Jerusalem at the center, they're actually inheriting this tradition from the Romans. And so interestingly, in some of the oldest maps, or the older maps, uh, the center of the map is in fact the Cyclades which is to say where the holy pagan island of Delos is. Uh, and so as a result of that, those are still then showing up as an earlier tradition. There's no particular reason why Christian monks would wanna put Delos, you know, and this important pagan center in the center of the world, but then that's where it initially probably is. And even in the Hereford map, the, the Jerusalem's here, there's still this other circle that had been the uh, center representing Delos. In Greece, this is the Cyclades. It's a it's a island that's uh, I think there's an important yes. temple of Hera on it, and so or who uh, dedicated to Apollo. Oh, to Apollo, and so it's the center of the therefore the Athenian League too in the Athenian Empire, or it's theoretically or traditionally. So, um, okay, so periphery. Where am I going? So anyway, another one of these is also. Uh, the cotton map, which probably again doesn't have Jerusalem as the center, and possibly again is this older Roman version that has Delos. In terms of the periphery, um, already in the first century, Plutarch tells us that geographers like to crowd into the edges of their maps 
parts of the world which they don't know about. <laughs> so they make maps and they don't know. Adding notes in the margin to the effect that beyond this lies nothing but sandy deserts full of wild beasts, unapproachable bogs, Scythian ikes, or a frozen sea. I might very well say of those uh, that are farther off, beyond this there is nothing but the pro prodigies and fictions. The only inhabitants are uh, the poets and the inventors of fables. There is no credit uh, and certainly no farther. So, Plutarch already is pretty savvy about how geographers fill their, their maps. Nevertheless, nevertheless um, we still have a tradition of here there be dragons. Um, it actually only appears on modern maps. Hicks and Tracones doesn't exist on any, um, any medieval map, but that doesn't mean that they, medieval people didn't put lots of fabulous things based on what the Romans had done, like, uh, uh, like Plutarch is complaining about. So for example, going back again to the cotton map, over here, there's actually a picture of a lion, and it actually says, Hic abundant leones, so here there be lions, or here lions abound. Um, and likewise, when we're looking at other maps like the Isidore map, we've got uh, lions and dragons that are down and the edges and the periphery of Africa here, so we're seeing them. And if we go back to that Psalter map, which had that circular Jerusalem at the center, you can see all the barbar barbarous peoples in Africa and these are people like the cannibals here who are eating legs, <laughs> and the blemies, you know, with the face in their, in their um, uh, shoulders, and there's also skeopod somewhere, <coughs> anyway, with one big, you know, antipode. Uh, anyway, <laughs> so. So anyway, so that's a little bit about center and periphery. So essentially, where's the center? Often the center is, you know, you, <laughs> you know, but then sometimes the center is, uh, if you, you yourself think of yourself as being part of something bigger than you, uh, then that could be what the center is. Yes? In the 13th century in, in Konya, in Konya yeah. there was a famous um, scholar called Nasset Noja, and someone asked, where is the center of the earth? He said, where my donkey's food is. <laughs> you can't believe it, you can't measure it. <laughs> <laughs> what? I'm actually from that place. You're from that place, from, yeah. from Konya is where it is? Yeah. So yeah, the center of the world that we have on good account from 14th century Turk is Konya. So anyway, <laughs> where the donkey was. You don't yeah. believe me, you can't measure yeah, it. Yeah, measure it, yeah, exactly, it's a good point. <laughs> so, so that's the case, you know, so we've, we did that before where it's like, where's the center of the universe? And so at a certain point it was the earth and then it was the sun and now we've decided that there isn't any center. <laughs> and so, uh, so anyway, in that same way, there may well not be a center of the earth, but you have to put a center to your map. Okay, so one of the things that I make uh, maps of um, in uh, my background is doing Latter-day Saint or a war in history and so I've actually made maps for um, dozens and dozens of Mormon history books uh, just because once you get into a specialty then nobody else makes them and anyway so then they ask you hey can I have a map for that anyway so a traditional map if you're doing the Mormon history map this is an old one um, which more or less shows this migration route uh, where the church starts in upstate New York and migrates across Ohio and Missouri and Illinois and then across the plains to Salt Lake, right? And so this is also showing on here um, another route of a battalion which happened during the Mexican-American War. But essentially it's the main route is that, that route up there from New York to Salt Lake. You can see the pioneer wagons, right? And so this is essentially the traditional map um, as it, it was always told and appears. So from Palmyra, New York to Kirtland, to far west Missouri, Nauvoo, winter quarters, and ultimately ending up in Salt Lake. Um, but, you know, I don't know if you can see that, but you know, the originally it's often shown on a current US map, but the reality is at the time, uh, things were changing and the frontier was going, expanding west in terms of the political frontier at the time. And even by the time Brigham Young and the Mormons first got to uh, Salt Lake uh, Valley, that was actually part of Mexico although the U.S. was also at war with Mexico with the purpose of trying to seize all of that land, including especially California. Um, but in any event, the Mormons got there before they had done so. It's also, though, a much more complicated migration story. Uh, essentially, the period of time, you know, in, especially in the Missouri period, is happening simultaneous to the Kirtland period. It's a technical detail that you don't have to worry about, but it is, in other words, there are much more complicated complications to the migration story. 
And one of the things that tends to get left off is that there's actually this moment uh, of a succession crisis and different Mormon groups went all kinds of different places, not simply to Utah. So whereas the most successful group and the most famous went to Utah, uh, there nevertheless uh, was, for example, quite a large colony, uh, Mormon colony in Upper Lake Michigan on an island called Beaver Island, uh, where a Mormon successor prophet named James Strang um, got some notoriety by uh, being crowned king and uh, being king essentially of Beaver Island. <laughs> So anyway, that's just one of many um, uh, such examples. There was another uh, very successful colony down in, next to where it's essentially Austin, Texas, and some of the earliest um, settlers down there. So another way that I sometimes show these though, so okay, that's had a more complicated map. Another way you can show things is sort of schematically through these kind of diagrams. So I make isometric diagrams here to show, for example, um, the evolution of temple practices uh, in, for Mormons. And so it starts here with this temple that exists in Kirtland, which is essentially has places for worship, for education, and for headquarters offices. When they go to Nauvoo in Illinois, uh, this is the when the founding prophet gets killed, he's added um, components, this idea of doing baptisms for the dead, these ideas of doing endowments or sealing. You might have heard of Mormons sealing families together forever, for time and all eternity. Those hadn't existed in the original temple, but those became much more important when they got out to Utah. And indeed, um, all the little Mormon temples, if you see a modern one today, only have those components, what were essentially the basement and the attic of this one, and that don't exist in this one, is essentially if you are raised Mormon, that's what you just simply think temples are about in the Mormon experience. Um, by contrast, this denomination, which has the same initial beginning, um, our headquarters temple in Missouri, again, doesn't use these later uh, additions that are what Mormons do in temples, but instead um, goes back to the original one. And so and it's essentially another way of schematically showing two different um, paths that could come off from that same origin. Another way of doing it is schematically. So you have that initial early church. It splits apart into all the different groups, including the main line that goes off to Utah, but all of the other ones that go in different um, kinds of directions. So you can kind of show, again, how you do maps, not maps, but schematic diagrams to show different things that are besides just geography. And we've had these before because we did a whole lecture here on, for example, um, Christianism and how do we get from having, um, let's say, the early uh, disciples of Jesus to having a big Catholic church, all these Orthodox churches, all these Protestants and Anglicans, and everybody else, you know, where did this all kind of come from? And so in this case, it's kind of showing uh, based on, let's say, number of adherents in each one of the kinds of constellation groups. And another kind of schematic that's showing that same kind of way is the poster that we have here on the wall you've maybe seen, where um, rather than showing, again, anything geographically or anything about size in terms of there's obviously way fewer uh, Jews and nowadays way fewer Zoroastrians than there are, let's say, Christians or Muslims. And yet um, what this is kind of showing is a constellation of different uh, religious ideas sharing uh, the golden rule, the principle of um, reciprocity, do unto others as you would have others do unto you is the way that Christians phrase it. But everybody else has one too, a way of phrasing it as well. So, anyway, that's, uh, that's my end of slides. But anyway, go ahead and you, you can comment. The flat Earth. Yes. You didn't mention that map. I didn't mention the Flat Earth. Yeah. <laughs> and and my, my question is actually, um, is. even in the... <laughs> I have a slide. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. Even in the um, ancient Greek time, the Earth was considered a sphere. How they came up out with the idea that the Earth is flat? Yeah, so where does the idea that the Earth is flat come from? So, um, so originally, so before ancient Greek times or early ancient Greek times, so before the um, the geometry, you know, the uh, the geographers. So geographers are the people who I mean, the, we even call geography. It means world measuring, right? And so, um, and so the geographers are, are are understanding that the world is a sphere, and they're also like. Uh, Archimedes actually getting really good measurements for essentially what the, the circumference of it is, right? But prior to that, people did often assume that the world uh, was flat. 
And so before, um, anyway, before that people had put a lot of study into it, and that's already though, whatever that is, it's like the fourth century BC that people under, are aware of the sphericity. Uh, and so one of the things though that exists is that, that uh, the earliest part of the Bible is written prior to that understanding. So it's written before um, uh, the Greeks and everybody understand that the world is a sphere. And so in fact, the, um, the Pentateuch or the five books of Moses or the Torah, that component, um, the underlying prophets assume that the world is flat. And so they have a flat, they describe it, and they don't say it's flat for sure, but, they, but if you read through their picture, it's quite clear that they're talking about a flat earth that has a uh, firmament or a hemisphere above it, which is to say a, um, it's essentially a hemisphere which has a, uh, it's like a glass dome. <laughs> and, up, and above the glass dome is water, and then below there's also uh, shoal, and so and below that there's also water under the earth, and so the earth is, um, you know, is essentially they've separated the water from the land, and and that's what God does, right? And so when when the flood happens, uh, God opens up the firmament, and all the water from outside of the the hemisphere goes in and goes onto the flat earth, and so the earth has its four corners and that kind of a thing. And so some people who read the Bible quite literally then recover want to recover a flat earth uh, theory because. The earlier prophets still probably believed in a flat earth, um, but in other places that it's, um, it's a quite a modern idea. <laughs> so uh, people who have really uh, promoted flat eartherism are, are mostly 20th century people. And so there was a, um, a very important, uh, I'm not, it's well known anyway sect in, um, called the, um, something like Universal, Apostolic Catholic Church, but it's not Catholic. Uh, it's a Protestant uh, Protestant denomination. They founded a um, a city called Zion, Illinois, and you can go there, and it's still laid out as a perfect system. And at the center of it is a temple lot where they were going to build the temple. And so this church um, prophet in the uh, early let's see, 1910s, 1920s. Um, absolutely promoted flat eartherism. And so he would take out ads in uh, Popular Science or Popular Mechanics magazine. And so he would put it out there and he'd say, if you, if you can prove that the world is round, um, then I will give you, you know, like $100,000 or something. And so it, would be, it made a huge sensation because everyone's like, oh, I can prove it. And so they all write him and of course, Oh, well, that doesn't prove it to his satisfaction. So there was, there was no way you could prove it to this guy. <laughs> you know? And so anyway, he made everybody very frustrated. But it also popularized the idea. And so uh, I would say that there's just a long-standing promotion of this idea. It's very clearly, I mean, what can I say? It's, it's anti-intellectual. It's like a conspiracy theory. Um, you know, but it's a particularly preposterous one. But anyway, it's, uh, it's not what medieval people thought. Medieval... Um, we didn't, there, there was no loss of, for example, um, technology in terms of the uh, seafaring people. So when you're, when you're a sailor, you, know, you can tell about the Earth's curvature because of when you see a ship's mast on the horizon, the part of it that you're seeing above the horizon or not. The, um, there's all sorts of different ways that it's quite well known um, that, uh, do I have another slide here? You know, so here's a medieval, <laughs> Here's a medieval manuscript from the 13th century. If you, then he says, showing the monks are saying, if the two people started walking, <laughs> they would walk around the earth and they'd meet around the other side because it's a sphere, you know. So I mean, um, I mean, if you've ever seen the um, orb that the Queen of England has, where it's a sphere and there's a cross on top, that's because she has sovereignty, because that means she's holding the world, which is to say a sphere. So people in the Middle Ages knew it was a sphere. <laughs> so uh, there's it's. Uh, not not knowledge that was lost. So they didn't believe that it was turning. They thought it was sitting there, <laughs> so they did not believe it was moving. And so the uh, there was all kinds of different arguments about why uh, that Aristotle made, for example, about why it's just not possible that the world could be moving because if it was moving, we'd feel it <laughs> move or something like that. Um, if it was moving, we'd constantly you know it's like if you if you get on a merry-go-round and it starts going like this, they were they were arguing why aren't we feeling that you know? And so they didn't have the um, Newtonian you know, laws of, you know, of motion to, in order to understand it. And so that's one of the reasons why, frankly, when, um, 
when Galileo even is still promoting a, a heliocentric uh, solar system, he wasn't able to um, describe how all the motion worked until Newton. And so this was an objection that Aristotelians, including the uh, leaders of the Catholic Church had to us that there's no, they don't have sufficient evidence to explain how the motion is working. And so there's all kinds of arguments that people had against the idea that uh, we would have to be moving around so fast, they're saying, we'd certainly, you know, we'd have to feel it or we'd fly off or all those kind of things, why don't we fly off? Uh, and so um, obviously we, we understand now about gravity, uh, momentum, all of these kind of things, but back then they didn't have those theories yet. And so, anyway, what I wanted to say kind of in conclusion about all of this, hopefully this was a fun lecture, there's lots of fun maps, um, and we can also kind of see the different ways that maps have been made and maps have been used, but one of the things that, um, the reason why I brought this up as a theme, not only because of my own personal love for maps, but is also because um, I feel like maps are one thing that we often um, are not using all of our kind of modern media savvy that we have, that where we approach, let's say even printed books, or academic books, or news, or other kinds of blog sources and things like that. But we also have to be leery of maps. Maps also have authors, maps also have agendas. There's all sorts of unspoken um, assumptions that are underlying maps. And so hopefully this little presentation has, um, anyway, shown you a little bit underneath the curtain of those maps. So. couple of quotations. John Dunn, at the round earth's imagined corners blow your trumpets, angels. And from a New Yorker cartoon many, many years ago, snotty kid to parent, you and Columbus think the earth is round, but it's not. It's an oblate spheroid. <laughs> oh, snotty kids. They're right. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Or? All right, well, thank you guys very, very much. Oh, here's one. Yes. It's Can we? Not like I'm not a, what? It's not exactly. Hello, no, thanks for the. For You're the very play. welcome. Um, it's not exactly a question or comment. It's just like if you can go a little bit deeper into how, map, how the maps actually influence a lot of power in the medieval or even like. My modern history, for example, when the New World was discovered that the church decided like, oh, from here, from here, uh, it's going to be for Portugal and yeah. for Spain yeah. or something like that. Or even like just how the like maps, I remember like we were in Europe last year and just maps was uh, like a commodity that like, only kings had that yes. was so important. So if you can go deeper into the oh, importance yeah. for the, of the power of having a map and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Those, your points are very well taken, which is to say we now, I kind of started at this where maps are ubiquitous now, at least among people who have smartphones and all these kind of things, and that's how we're viewing the world. Um, but like you point out, you know, if you go back into the early modern period, all of those um, coastline maps, for example, those were uh, incredibly valuable state secrets. They're not only could only kings afford them, they were also keeping them secret from each other because there's a trade comp competition and these kind of things. I mean, one of the whole reasons for all of these maps, like these imperial maps here where um, Britain is laying claim to vast swashes of land that nobody, no English person has any been anywhere near, um, was once they made those claims, in some sense, like I showed with the borders where we now can see the border of North Korea or we now can see that border in, in between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, that in some cases they've made these things real, <laughs> right? And so by going in, by staking out imperial claims, um, both across Africa and all across the, uh, the West, uh, the people who actually were there, their uh, land is all expropriated. The imperial powers were able to claim like ownership of land, you know, so one of the things that maps are doing is backing up um, European concepts of property and property ownership and all those kind of things. And so um, one of the things that I, I, this was already going long, but one of the things that I was also um, uh, was going to have a little divergence and show is essentially how surveying works and how you go from a big map like this to um, you know, the individual checkerboard that we can kind of see across North America today. So North America, if you go out, look out a plane, you know, is a bunch of squares uh, through most of it. 
Uh, and that's because of how the surveys ultimately work and how essentially the whole thing is divided up, expropriated. Um, the entire um, American and Canadian dream of the 19th century was the federal governments would um, license, you know, they'd make negotiate treaties with native peoples, which just to say, take license to all of their land. <laughs> And so that by, according to this treaty now, we own, the, the federal government now owns the land. And so then newly expropriated or stolen uh, lands were then able to be sold at either f for very little, for just a few dollars or for, for free in case of homesteading to uh, European settlers or, or European Canadian or European American settlers who already, you know, in other words, excess population from the earlier settlements who then moved and met homesteaded and farmed. And so settlers who went out and created essentially subsistence uh, farms that were the essentially the 19th century model of getting across the continent. So I mean, your point is quite quite well taken. I mean, in terms of the um, the particular example of the Pope uh, drawing the line and things like that, that one has been especially part of Protestant propaganda. And so the Protestants were. Um, trying to show papal arrogance and things like that. It did have the, the effect, though, of kind of the dividing line between Brazil and, and uh, uh, the rest of Spanish-speaking uh, uh, South America. So there, there were substantial effects that even that line had. Thank you. Thank you so much.